Welcome to lecture 7. So this is on rate monotonic schedulers. So our last discussion on EDF was on dynamic priorities. This will be on static priorities. <coughs> so what we have seen in EDF is that the priority changes over time. But in this case, the priority of a task is proportional to its frequency. So the higher is the frequency of the task or the lower is the period of the task, the higher is its priority. So the priority can be represented on the y-axis and the frequency of the task, which is 1 by the time period, can be represented on the x-axis. Then what we will see over here is that we will see a linear relationship between the priority of a task and its frequency. So, uh, so, so kindly understand or keep in mind that in this case, the priority of a task, regardless of when actually it is scheduled, remains the same. So that is why this is known as a static priority algorithm as opposed to algorithms such as EDF, where the priority of, for the same task changes over time. So in rate monotonic scheduling, as I said, the priority is 1 over the period. So for high priority process uh, like this, the priority is high because the period is low. And for a lower priority process, as you can see, the period is higher. So here again, similar to EDF, we have preemptive scheduling. So this basically means uh, that uh, uh, tasks can preempt each other, right? So, so this is something which is allowed. So again, if we look at this, so we will use uh, either the EI, PI or CI is the same as EI, execution time or the time it takes to complete. So these terms will be used interchangeably. So of course, there are a lot of theorems with regards to this. So one theorem that we will use is that for two tasks, if let's say the sum of the utilization, so which in this case is 2 by 4 plus 1 by 8, which comes to 0 0.625, if this is less than 2 times square root of 2 minus 1, then it is guaranteed that it is RMA schedulable. So this is a test of schedulability. And in this case, RMA schedulability is guaranteed. All right. <clears throat> so this is because 2 times square root of 2 minus 1 is 0 0.82. 0 0.625 is less than or equal to 0 0.82. Hence, schedulability in this case is guaranteed. So if you can see uh, over here, we can actually create an active schedule in the sense first we can schedule the first instance of T1. Then we can schedule an instance of T2, right, which is over here, so on and so forth. Again, after 4, another instance of T1. So you can see that it is schedulable. Let us look at another instance where, of course, the sum of the utilizations is 1. So this is greater than the RMA scheduling bound. So as I said, <coughs> The utilization, the sum of the utilizations or the total utilization being less than or equal to 1 for a uni processor, this is a necessary condition. So this has to hold all the time. But the point is that in the case of RMA, if it is less than 0 0.82, you are guaranteed to find a schedule. Whereas more than 0 0.82, you may be able to find or you may not be able to find. So in this case, let's take a look at it. So the first two units, you schedule T1. So in this case, uh, uh, basically T1 is the higher priority because uh, its period is lower. And then T2 comes. Uh, so what we can do is that uh, we can schedule T2. So the active task will again be T1 and T2 over here. So again, we schedule T1. And uh, then again, we schedule T2. So as you can see, so that some task sets that fail the utilization bound on RMS are actually schedulable. But again, uh, the thing is that this is a sufficient bound and it is not, a, you know, it's not an exact bound. All right. Uh, so basically what it means is that even if the utilization is more than 0 0.82, the task sets may be schedulable. So basically the 
RMA algorithm is an optimal uniprocessor static priority scheduling algorithm, which means that uh, if RMA cannot schedule a set of periodic tasks, then no other static priority algorithm can schedule a set of periodic tasks. So, of course, it has a bunch of uh, schedulability tests which we should look at. Right, so basically, uh, okay, so this animation came up over here, which again said that RMA is the most optim optimal among all the static priority schedulable scheduling algorithms. So the schedulability tests are like this. So, so this is of course a necessary condition that we have see been seeing for quite some time. In this case, the sum of the utilizations is less than or equal to 1. Right, so this has to hold all the time. So in the case of EDS, uh, EDF, I'm sorry, earliest deadline first, this was found to be sufficient. But in the case of the rate monotonic scheduling algorithm, so it's called RMS or it's called RMA. RMA is rate monotonic analysis and RMS is rate monotonic scheduling. In either case, this is necessary, but uh, it is uh, you know, what is sufficient, we will see. So the sufficient bound in this case is much lower, right? So the sufficient condition, which uh, you can see uh, there is a link to it on the website of the course. There is a Liu and Leyland bound, which was the first to actually provide a sufficient uh, case for RMA, right? Uh, so I'll be using the terms RMA and RMS. So I'm more used to using RMA, but when I... Uh, I should make a point that I will use RMA or RMS interchangeably, right? So they mean exactly the same thing. So in this case, we still rely on the sum of the utilization. So recall that even in the case of EDF, we have we had used the sum of the utilization as uh, by far, uh, you know, as the metric of choice. So in this case, it is dependent on the number of tasks. So the sum of the utilization should be less than n times 2 raised to the power 1 by n minus 1. <clears throat> so let us set n equal to 2. So this will become 2 times 2 raised to the power half minus 1, which is nothing but 2 times square root of 2 minus 1, which is 0 0.82. So this gives us the bound for two tasks. So if we look at the number of tasks in the utilization bound, what we will see is that gradually this will fall in a curve like this. And uh, so over time it will saturate. So what is the value of saturation? So that will be when n tends to infinity. And at that point, it will be the natural log of 2, which is nothing but 0 0.69. So this is the limit. So basically it means that as long as the utilization is less than roughly 69%, uh, we are guaranteed RMA scheduling and RMA scheduling in a certain sense is simpler because unless unlike EDF where we'll have to continuously maintain deadlines and so on uh, where the deadlines are variable and we need to maintain queues and so on in this case uh, the need for maintaining a priority queue and so on is substantially reduced so RMA as I have said it saturates at 0 0.69, which is the natural log of 2. So which means that less, less than this utilization, you will always be successful. So the Liu and Leyland bound did <clears throat> uh, create a bound for the maximum utilization, which falls as the number of tasks increases. And uh, for infinity, it becomes log of 2, which is 0 0.692. So there are, of course, several examples. I'll not go through them. But uh, so here in this case, uh, of course, the assumption is so one assumption I didn't make about RMA is that the deadline is equal to the period. So as I've always been arguing, if the deadline is more than the period, it will just induce buffering and it's not practical. So what we should look at is cases where the deadline is less than the period. So there, of course, there is another class of algorithms which we will study in the next lecture known as DMA. But for the time being, we assume that the period and the deadline are the same. So again, 
uh, if I were to look at this example, the utilization would be less than equal to 1. Uh, so basically, it also satisfies the RMA bound, hence it is RMA schedulable, which is basically we just schedule as per the priority of tasks. And the priority of a task is given by its frequency, right? It's proportional to its frequency or 1 by time period. <clears throat> so can we construct an example for which EDF and RMA produce different schedules? Well, possibly the simplest answer would be to consider something which is not schedulable in RMA, but its utilization is less than equal to 1. So in that case, it will be EDF schedulable, but it will not be RMA schedulable. Right? <clears throat> so basically, uh, any such non-trivial example would also be Right, so this is a simple answer, but another non-trivial example of this would be a task set in which let's say a task is preempted before completion by another high priority task and that leads to it missing its deadline in RMA, but it does not miss its deadline in EDF because we go by deadline scheduling and given the fact that its deadline is very close, it continues to execute and finishes before the deadline. So an example, let's say, could be something of this type, where the execution time is 3 units, 3 and 8 and 6 and 12, respectively. So in this case, uh, the sum of the utilizations would be 3 by 8 plus 6 by 12, which is half. All right. So then this would be 7 by 8. And 7 by 8 is clearly more than <coughs> the RMA, uh, RMA bound of 83%. Nonetheless, let's take a look. So the RMA scheduling would be like this, that in this case, uh, the we would have this task running. Uh, so the first task would run. Uh, then the second task would run, but it would be preempted by T1 because it has a higher priority. Right? And then, of course, T1 will run. So the question is that uh, does it run to completion or what does it do? So in the other case, T2 completes and uh, T1 runs, which is the case of EDF. So let us now look at the deadlines. So in the case of uh, T2, uh, it does meet its deadlines. But as you can see, we have a different schedule that RMA and EDF produce in the sense that in the case of EDF, T2 is not preempted because its deadline is closer. Whereas in the case of RMA, T2 is preempted. So regarding the worst case completion time of tasks, so RMA, it is possible to look at or derive a worst case completion time. So worst case completion time, we are referring to as WCCT. So we will look at the Lehotsky's formula to compute the worst case completion time, which is also known as the worst case execution time, uh, which, you know, which is quick, which takes O1 time. So it's a simple formula to compute the absolute worst case for an RMA. But on the other hand, for EDF, there is no closed formula. It requires the examination of one full major cycle, where the major cycle is defined as an LCM of the periods. So, and it is uh, the time it takes is roughly order n, where n is the number of tasks. So this is something which is computationally heavy, as opposed to an RMA, where we will look at Liu and Lehotsky is bound, uh, where we will see uh, how to derive a formula for the worst case execution time under RMA. Other problems, so which one do you think incurs more context, which is EDF or RMA? So one claim is that RMA does incur more context, which is primarily because it is, you know, doesn't really take deadlines into account and whenever a task comes in, uh, you know, based on a static priority, it just switches the context. And uh, also another question that you need to answer, I'll not provide the answer, is that consider a task set which is schedulable under RMA. Do ED, RMA and EDF produce identical schedules? So the hint is that you look at this slide, you will get the answer. So again, a few more examples are here. I will not look at it uh, for rate monotonic scheduling and EDF. 
So these are two tasks uh, where, as you can see, EDF can schedule it, but there are deadline misses in RMS. But uh, this can be looked at in great detail, uh, you know, by yourselves. So I'll not get into the details. So let's go back to the Liu and Leyland condition once again. So that did place an upper bound of 69% regardless of the number of tasks, right? And this is quite conservative in the sense that this is a sufficient condition. It's not a necessary condition, right? So it's extremely conservative. So we can, of course, uh, take things uh, slightly higher. So a lot of experiments suggest that let's say between 69 to 88% is kind of a gray area or a brown area where a large number of tasks are actually schedulable even though they fall outside this bound, right? Uh, so there is a need for better bounds and this is how, you know, people arrived at the Lehovsky's condition, right? Uh, so basically, if I look at it, of course, there are many more examples. Again, I'll not go into great detail into these. But uh, what you will see that for three tasks, the utilization uh, for this is uh, 0 0.753 for instance, so it's RMA schedulable. But again, I could slightly modify this task, increase the utilization. It will not be RMA, it will not pass the Liu and Leyland condition, but it still may be RMA schedulable with a very high likelihood, right? So basically, we have looked at uh, you know, this came from actually common sense arguments, which basically translates to the fact that at any point of time on a uniprocessor, only one task can execute. This is exactly what this means. This is the Liu and Leyland bound. Let us now look at Liu and Lehovsky's completion time theorem, which in a sense gives us a worst case, right? And uh, this is slightly tighter and more accurate and can be used for rate monotonic scheduling, right? Slightly more frequently at least. So now uh, we will look at this bound. So the first theorem is that if you consider a set of uh, tasks, right? They actually see their worst case if all of them are kind of all issued at t equal to zero, right? So what would be a you know, what would be an informal proof? So let us consider, uh, let's say, two tasks, T1 and T2, where the time period of T1 is less than the time period of T2, which basically means the priority of T1 is greater than the priority of T2. All right? So assume that uh, a task T2 was issued at time equal to zero. And then at a later point of time, slightly later, T1 was released. Given the fact that T1 has a higher priority, it will execute and it will preempt T2. And T2 will execute after that. So let us now change the condition or, you know, let's say, let's assume that T1 and T2 have the same phasing or the same phase, right? So then what will happen is that if T1 and T2 are both released at the same time, this would be a different condition where both T1 and T2, both their instances come at the same time. So in this case, again, T1 would execute first and the execution of T2 would be deferred. But if you compare the scenario one with scenario two, what you see is that in scenario one, at least T2 was able to do some work, right, at the beginning. And then, of course, the rest got deferred. And then, of course, T1 will keep coming and so on. But at least it got a head start. In this case, it doesn't get a head start. And, uh, you know, its work starts only after T1 finishes. So in the worst case, right, it will, uh, you know, it stands to get delayed more in scenario two as compared to scenario one, where at least it does some work ahead of T1. So that is the reason any such scenario one will always be more beneficial for T2 as compared to scenario two, where T1 and T2 come together. This is why scenario two is regarded as a worst case for T2. Of course, for T1, it doesn't matter because it's the highest priority. 
So I can always extend this argument to a set of multiple tasks, T1, T2, T3, T4, and so on, and pretty much prove that what I can do is if I just interchange two tasks, right? In the sense, you know, I'm just basically uh, interchanging, or let's say if I just move ahead a high priority task, then, you know, I will have a strictly worse schedule, right? Not a strictly worse schedule, but a possibly worse schedule, but I'll definitely not improve things. So this is, this essentially tells us that from the point of view of any task, right, forget about higher priority, uh, so, sorry, forget about lower priority tasks, but if all of his higher priority tasks are issued at the same time as it is being issued, then of course it's the absolute worst case, right? Uh, so that is why keeping this in mind, we can derive a couple of results which will indicate that for a given task, what is its, uh, you know, what is its worst case, right? Under zero phasing. So zero phasing is something that we were discussing which basically means that all the tasks are issued at the same time, which is t equal to zero. So this is considered the worst case for schedulability or this is known as zero phasing. So we want to analyze the schedulability under this only because if something is schedulable in the worst case, it's schedulable in any other case as well. So uh, let me just remove the clutter on this slide. I hope the idea of zero phasing was clear. So the main idea is that anything is RMA schedulable for all task phasings if it is schedulable for zero phasing, right? So regardless of the phase, if we can say that in a hypothetical scenario where all tasks T1 to Tn are all issued at T equal to zero, this for me is the worst case because from the point of view of any individual task, if I just move it, <clears throat> earlier, if I just move all the high priority tasks earlier, then its schedule is, you know, either remains the same, it's worst case, or it gets strictly worse. It never gets better. So that is why zero phasing is for us a lower lip. So how do you check the schedulability of a task, uh, task set? Consider zero phasing. For each task, look at the schedules and the deadlines see if it is schedulable or not. If all the tasks are schedulable, the entire task set is schedulable. So working out so many schedules is cumbersome, so let's do some math. So the worst case completion time occurs when it is in phase with high priority tasks. This we have already proven, right, when the phase is zero. So in this case, T1 is in phase with T2, because as you can see, uh, they are multiples of each other right and the phase is zero uh, in the second case which is phase which is case b there is a phase lag of 20 and so they are not in phase right so this is the first execution and this is the second execution and as you can see zero phasing produces a longer time of completion as opposed to a non-zero phasing right so hence we look at zero phasing so this has been proven but this is just an example to, uh, you know, uh, enunciate whatever is there in the proof. So Liu and Lewowski's criterion is like this. A task will meet its first deadline if. <clears throat> so basically, let's first uh, look at uh, the terminology. So let the tasks themselves be T1 to Tn, where, you know, their periods. So P1 is the period of task T1. That is less than or equal to P2, which is the period of task T2, which is less than or equal to P3, which is less than or equal to Pn, which is the period of task Tn. Uh, so clearly the priorities uh, go in the other way, right? So now what I do is I take a look at Ti, which is the period of task I. So then what I do is I look at all the higher priority tasks, which are from one to I minus one. So the number of high priority tasks that will be released in this time period, right, is basically ceiling of PI by PJ, right? So a simple division and we take the ceiling because it's possible that one high priority task may be released here and there may still be some time left for its period to end. 
But if we want all of them to complete within this time period, then we take the ceiling and we multiply that with the execution time of uh, task uh, EJ, right? So uh, mind you, we are using the terms EJ and CJ interchangeably here in this presentation. So flow, ceiling of PI by PJ is the number of instances of the Jth period in the Ith period, that's the ceiling, multiplied with the execution time of J, which is EJ. So this, so this is the amount of time that it will take to finish this many instances of task J, right, completely. If I sum this up, this is essentially all the work that my high priority tasks will do. I add EI to it, which is the work that the ith task, which is the task under consideration will do. So this is the total demand that is being placed on the CPU within the time PI. If this is less than equal to PI, we are done, right? So you go back to the proof of EDF. We used a very similar logic and a very similar terminology over there also. So the point is we are doing something quite similar. Note the ceiling. So this is this was the criterion pretty much. So consider three periodic tasks. Check whether they are RMA schedulable. So 20, 100, 30, 150, 60, 200. If we check for the Liu and Leyland criterion, so this comes to 0 0.7, which is less than 0 0.78, which is nothing but this expression. This criterion is satisfied, therefore the task set is schedulable. Now next example, consider three periodic tasks, check once again. In this case, it is 0 0.85, which is greater than 0 0.78. So at least it doesn't satisfy the test. But let us now check the liu Lehoski condition. So in this case, <coughs> uh, we will have a bunch of conditions. And uh, we see that T1 meets its deadlines. I'm just showing a schedule. So uh, you can, uh, given that the <coughs> video can be paused at any point of time, you can take a look at the scheduling. So T1 meets its first deadline, as you can see, because T1's deadline is 100. T2 meets its first deadline because T2's deadline is 150. T3 meets its first deadline because T3's deadline is 200, right? And uh, if I look at the criterion, <clears throat> so basically for T1, of course, 20 less, for T1, it is trivially satisfied, right? For T2, uh, right, uh, so basically it will be 30 is the time of execution of T2, okay? Uh, so then uh, the ceiling of P2 by P1 is actually ceiling of 150 by 100, which is nothing but 2. So this is 70, which is less than execution time, which is 150. This is also satisfied. And then uh, now we look at T3, which is 90 plus ceiling of P3 by P1, which is 2. Ceiling of P2 by, uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, ceiling of P3 by P2, which is again 2. I add up all of this. This is, comes to 190, which is less than 200. So all the three tasks pass the Liu and Lehoski's condition, right? Which was another of our RMA conditions. And this, again, is a sufficient condition. So what you can see is that all three are getting satisfied. So this basically means that as compared to the Liu and Leyland sufficient condition, I have something which is slightly more elaborate, slightly more difficult to compute, but this allows me a better bound. So if we just go back to the last slide, uh, sorry, the one before that, where we compute the bound, we see that 0.85 is greater than 0.78. So this clearly fails, but given that fact that all tasks, so which even though, as I said, may violate the basic Liu Leyland test, but since the other bound, which is the Lehovsky's criterion, is slightly more realistic, we see that if that is satisfied, the task set is still schedulable. 
A few more practice problems, I'll not get into that. So what if a task set fails Leo Lehozky's criterion, what happens then? So many of these things are discussed in great detail in Leo Lehozky's paper, which was published in 1989. So actually, the, the, what I've shown is a simpler version of their test. So their test is actually slightly more complex than that. So the more complex version of the test is if and only if, in the sense it is both necessary as well as sufficient. Uh, so basically, Liu Lehoski's test, of course, does check the worst case in terms of zero phasings. So it is, of course, possible that a zero phasing may actually may not occur. And then the task set may actually be schedulable, which is something that uh, the Liu Lehoski tests uh, will not capture. So some more issues about RMA. So RMA is stable under transient overload conditions in the sense that uh, Unlike EDF, which didn't react very well to transient overloading, given the fact that RMA doesn't really care about dynamic priorities, it is way stabler. And uh, it also can be guaranteed that uh, you know high priority tasks will, st will still keep continuing to execute, as opposed to EDF, where you know we are not tying a priority with a task, and consequently high priority tasks, which we perceive to be high priority, may actually get displaced, right? So even when a task gets late, uh, it has to yield, uh, yield the CPU to higher priority task, which is quite unlike EDF, right? So this is uh, exactly why RMA is considered a slightly better bet when we are looking at more of deterministic scheduling. Implementation of RMA, well, uh, we can keep tasks in a simple FIFO queue. Searching for the most frequent would be order n, insertion order 1, do it better. So basically, in this case, also maintain a priority queue, where finding the highest priority task just takes order 1 time, and insertion takes order log n. If we want to do better, we use the same trick as EDF, which is something similar to what is done in radix sorting so in this case we have a multi-level feedback queue so which as i said is organized as per the priority levels right so i will not uh, go more into it we have already looked at uh, this in the case of edf but i will talk about something which is uh, a special case so it is a set of harmonically related tasks which means for every two tasks ti and tk if pi is greater than pk, right, then it means that pi is also a multiple of pk, which means pi is n times pk, where n is an integer. So any two tasks are harmonically related. So for harmonically related tasks, RMA schedulability is kind of special. So in this case, it becomes the same as the EDF schedulability. EDF schedulability would basically say that the sum total of the utilization has to be greater than equal to, sorry, less than equal to one. So as long as this holds, which is our, which is also a necessary condition, by the way, then the set of tasks are RMA schedulable, right? So for this special case, all that we need, which is both necessary as well as sufficient, is that the utilization is less than equal to one. So by the theorem, which is a Lehovsky's criterion, we have this. It is just that the ceiling now makes no sense because pi is an integral multiple of pk. So given the fact that we have integral multi multiples over here, <coughs> what we can do is that we can divide by pi on both sides. So we'll have ei by pi plus these. So it just, uh, then it gets converted to this, which is summation of i equal to 1 to n ei by pi, which is nothing but the peak utilization, which is less than or equal to 1. So you see that the Lehovsky's criterion automatically takes us to the necessary condition, and this becomes if and only if. So again, RMA versus EDF. 
So in EDF, we looked at uh, primarily this. So in RMA, of course, all of these things changed. So these things were not important anymore. And what really mattered is a different Liu Leyland bound and later the Lehovsky's criterion. In EDF, there are many context switches in RMA. Uh, the number of context switches are few. And needless to say, this is much simpler. Right? So that is also one of the positive aspects of this. One of the positive traits of it, that this is a much simpler uh, priority scheduling algorithm where we don't really have to keep track of any deadline. So RMA is heavily used. So it's used in space. Uh, it's used in a lot of embedded applications. It has influenced the specs of many IEEE standards, including IEEE Future Bus Plus. It is widely used for offline analysis of time critical systems, verification, and so on. So RMA in many ways, RMA and EDF have defined the direction of the field. So this brings us to the end of lecture seven. We will continue with discussion, uh, discussing ramifications of RMA in the next lecture, which will be lecture eight in this.